two bookies are separately ambushed and slain by unknown assailants, while a young guy is killed by a sniper nearby. Smith approaches a young guy at a bus terminal, and tells him about Max and the Kansas City Shuffle. Two decades ago, Max had borrowed money from the mob to gamble on a rigged horse race, only for the horse to die in the middle of the race. The mob executed Max, his wife, and their young son Henry, as a warning to anyone who might try to wager on a manipulated race. Smith explains that the Kansas City Shuffle was a deceptive double bluff, before duping and killing the young guy, and transporting his body on a truck. In New York, as he finishes shaving, Slevin Calevra wipes the steam off a restroom mirror. Slevin has a fractured nose. A thumping knock is heard at his door, as he wipes the leftover shaving cream from his face. He walks to answer the door, clad just in a towel, the banging continuing despite his calling out that he is coming. He opens the door, and a young woman Lindsay enters immediately, unfazed by the fact that the man standing in front of her is not Nick. Slevin makes a comment about Lindsay having a deceptively tall knock, that the sound of her hammering on the door, echoed in a way that led Slevin to believe she was much taller than she was. Lindsay inquires as to what has become of Slevin's nose. He claims he was hit by someone he didn't expect. He starts telling Lindsay a tale about bad things happening in threes. First, he lost his job, then he got home to find out his apartment building had been condemned. He went to his girlfriend Kelly's house, and discovered her having sex with another man. As a result, Slevin traveled to New York to visit a dear friend of his, Nick. He was on the phone with Nick after the plane arrived, when a guy approached him and asked for a smoke, then demanded his money and hit him in the nose, fracturing it. This is four awful things, not three, as Lindsay points out. She also mentions that the robber didn't steal Slevin's bag or his beautiful watch. Slevin shifts the conversation's focus, by asking her to tell him her name. She inquires as to where Nick is, to which Slevin responds that he is yet to arrive. He was due to meet Slevin at the flat. He allowed himself in, since the door was unlocked. Slevin picks up the phone when it rings, but the caller hangs up. Lindsay promptly contacts the call return number, then pretends she dialed the wrong number, and informs Slevin that the call originated at the Hotel Cheval. She claims that now that she knows who the man called, it's time to figure out who called him. To Slevin's delight, she proceeds to describe her detective job by quoting Columbo. She dials another number, and is connected to the same hotel. Lindsay believes Nick is in jeopardy, and the anonymous caller who called the hotel may be a clue. Lindsay abruptly declares that she needs to go to work, and runs out of the flat, but forgetting the cup of sugar she came to borrow, rushes back in, just as Slevin had opened the towel to remove it, giving her a clear view of what it was hiding. Slevin goes back to the bathroom when Lindsay departs. The doorbell rings again. Slevin hurriedly opens the door, believing Lindsay is back, but enters two men named Elvis and Slow, who works for someone known as the boss. Believing that he is Nick, they kidnap him, and bring him to their boss. The boss lives in the penthouse of a well-guarded building, and is the supposed head of a huge crime ring. When they start talking, Slevin tries to act smart, and they get into a verbal cat and mouse game. Finally, the boss discloses that Nick, as they all believe Slevin to be, owes him $96,000 in gaming debt. To get out of this obligation, he must perform the boss a favor, and assassinate the son of the rabbi, a rival criminal boss. The rabbi is an ordained rabbi, and his son Yitzhak, is known as the fairy due to his homosexuality. This is in vengeance for the boss's son's murder, which he blames on the rabbi. As Slevin leaves, the boss begins speaking to a man, who has apparently masterminded the whole affair. The man is Smith, and he was the one who had been hired to kill the fairy. The boss asks him why he didn't carry the job out himself, and the man just responds, that he will indeed kill somebody. Two guys hiding inside a vehicle, disguised as a plumbing truck, take a photo of Slevin as he is brought out of the building and into the car, and one informs the other, that they need to phone someone named Brykowski. There's a new face in town. Slevin enters Nick's flat once more. Lindsay arrives, intending to transport him to the Hotel Cheval. Nick hasn't come there yet. Lindsay has a friend who works at the hotel, and can find out who called the apartment on their behalf. She notices Slevin staring carefully at the newspaper he'd picked up. On the main page, there's a headline about Slim Hopkins going missing, which is ironic given that Hopkins is suspected of being involved in a number of other inexplicable disappearances. Slevin informs Lindsay that he met Slim, and that he was dead when they first met. Lindsay hears her phone ring in her apartment, and hurries to answer it, thinking it may be her hotel roommate. While waiting for her, Slevin begins to dress. When he goes to answer the door, he is greeted by two Hasidic-looking guys, who inform him that Shlomo wishes to see him. Slevin tries to say that he doesn't know any Shlomo, but he receives another punch in the stomach, and is once again kidnapped, but this time he is going to visit the rabbi. He notices he's being brought back to the boss's building, as he's driven to visit Shlomo, 
the rabbi, but Saul says that the rabbi resides in a building immediately across the street. The rabbi and the boss were once partners, and even close friends, but one day they turned on one other, and attempted to murder each other, and neither has left the protection of their respective penthouses since. Slevin's interaction with the rabbi turns into another game of linguistic cat and mouse, with Slevin fearlessly responding to the rabbi. The rabbi ultimately tells Slevin that he owes him $33,000, as despite his objections, they believe Slevin is Nick Fisher. He has 48 hours to raise money by whatever means necessary. After Slevin is escorted away, the rabbi begins informing someone unseen, that he's made half of a pre-arranged payment to the person's account in the Cayman Islands, and the other half would be paid after their old buddy is in the grave. When Smith appears, the rabbi inquires about Slevin. Smith just states that the youngster and he have some unfinished business. Later, Slevin informs the boss that he would assassinate the fairy. Smith is somehow engaged with both sides, and is responsible for Nick's debts being called in, and he plots to assassinate Slevin after the fairy dies, and make it appear like they both committed suicide, all while Slevin is visiting the mafia leaders. Slevin and Lindsay have dinner plans, and Slevin sets up an appointment with the fairy. Detective Brykowski, who is investigating the boss and the rabbi, approaches Slevin. Brykowski, who used to gamble large with one of the assassinated bookies, has also learned that Smith has returned to town for the first time in 20 years, and believes there is a link between the boss, the rabbi, Smith, and Slevin. Later, when the detective bothers him again, Slevin gives his entire name. Slevin comes to the fairy's apartment for his date, and fatally kills him, only for Smith to show up. Instead of shooting Slevin, Smith finishes the fairy, indicating that Slevin and Smith are cooperating. Slevin then drags the bus terminal victim's body inside the apartment, revealing it to be Nick Fisher, while Smith murders the fairy's bodyguards. The bodyguards had been informed about their charge's murder, and rushed in through a special door built in the wall, but they were immediately killed by Smith, who used two silenced pistols. Smith and Slevin then blow up the flat. The boss and the rabbi are kidnapped by Smith and Slevin, and both awake in the boss's penthouse. Slevin shows up and announces the big twist. The mobsters that killed Max were the boss and the rabbi, and Slevin is Henry, the son of the ill-fated Max. Smith is revealed to be the assassin paid to kill young Henry, who instead took him in, and reared him after a moral crisis. Slevin explains 20 years later, that he and Smith killed the mobster's bookies, while stealing the ledgers. They assassinated Nick and took his identity, after identifying him as owing a large sum of money to both sides. Then Slevin assassinated the boss's son, in order to persuade the boss to hire Smith, to assassinate the rabbi's son in retaliation. Under his Nick Fisher pseudonym, Smith acquired the boss's contract to murder the fairy, and persuaded the rabbi that he would protect the fairy, on the condition that they both call in Nick's debts, enabling Slevin and Smith unrestricted access to the well-guarded mobsters. Slevin then suffocates the rabbi and the boss, by taping plastic bags over their heads, after disclosing his identity, murdering them in the same manner they killed his father. Smith shoots Lindsay to conceal his identity, as she had photographed him while investigating Nick's abduction. Brykowski receives a phone call from his boss, while on the lookout for Slevin, and discovers the origin of the alias Slevin Kalevra. Lucky number Slevin was the horse his father had bet on, and Kalevra is Hebrew for bad dog, which is similar to Smith's moniker. Brykowski murdered Slevin's mother 20 years ago, in order to pay off his gambling debts. As he hears this narrative, Brykowski accepts his fate, as Slevin emerges in Brykowski's backseat and shoots him, completing his masterpiece of retribution. Slevin is subsequently approached by Lindsay at the bus terminal, and it is revealed, that Smith had told Slevin, he had to murder Lindsay since she had a photograph of him. It's also revealed that Slevin disclosed his actual identity to Lindsay, and assisted her in faking her death around the same time. Slevin explains to Smith, who is aware of the deception, that he had to save Lindsay, and doesn't believe Smith would understand. Smith says he understands, and agrees to leave Lindsay alone, because he saved him as a child. Smith returns Slevin's father's old watch, before vanishing into the mob. The film jumps back 20 years to when Smith initially saved little Henry, they drive away, and Smith listens to Kansas City Shuffle on the radio.